So, in preparation for my message uh, to you folks today, I've been praying, like, God, what, what do you want your people to hear from you? And just this reoccurring theme, it, it's hit me from so many different angles. Personally, I've had to wrestle with some things, but also I've heard of other people having the same sort of struggles. And uh, it, it just seems like God has a theme here. And I believe today, being that it's Communion Sunday, what I'm going to bring to you today really applies to that as well. And um, I'm going to be talking to you today about forgiveness. Now, when somebody hurts us deeply, steps on our toes the wrong way, maybe they offend us, they uh, shortchange us, they, f they frustrate us, and they say the wrong things, and it digs us or embarrasses us, or they do something that is absolutely devastating to our lives. Um, how, do we, how do we roll with that? How do we respond? Now, it's not always easy for us to respond in a way that is pleasing to God, is it? All of you here are human. When you get hurt, it's pretty near impossible in your own flesh to truly be able to forgive. And I've come to that conclusion that without God's help, we're lost in this state. Somewhere, I mean, you can try to forgive, but without God's help, I'm not so sure that anyone can truly forgive. Now, you look at um, the movies that are presented out there in our society, and a lot of them are about gaining revenge uh, against someone who has brought great hurt to, to them or to their family, right? It's all about getting even and uh, seeing justice done. So, I'd like to challenge you for a minute to think, just to think about a person maybe in your life who has hurt you the most. Maybe it's a parent. Maybe it's a spouse. Maybe it's someone that uh, picked on you at school incessantly. There's so many different ways we can get hurt. I, I'd like you to think about that. Maybe it's someone that just literally drives you up the wall with their demeanor and everything they do just grates on you. And, they, and they, they say the wrong things at the wrong times. And you just can't, in your flesh, stand to be around them. May I be so bold to ask you this question? Have you forgiven that person for the way that they have wronged you? I'd like to read you a Bible verse from the book of Matthew, chapter 18. Verses 20 to 21 in Matthew 18 says this, Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not just seven times, but seven. Seventy-seven times. Seventy times seven. If we identify ourselves as being Christians, what Jesus is saying here is that we are called to forgive without limitations. When Peter asked this question, in himself, he could say, well, you know, someone hurt me really bad. Maybe I can forgive them once, twice, maybe even numerous times. But, man, after a while, that person is just, ah, oh, I've got to compartmentalize this. I can't forgive more than seven times. So, Lord, should I just forgive seven times? And Peter was looking at forgiveness as, 
as all humans do, is, is something that he could either withhold or give as he pleased. But in this small parable that Jesus talked to Peter in, he showed Peter that forgiveness was a, was a state of the heart that believers were to have with no limitations. There's only one option. Peter, if you're to be my follower, you must forgive unconditionally. Now, for us to harbor bad feelings, bitterness, or contempt towards anyone, regardless of the reason, according to the teachings of Jesus here, is just plain wrong. We identify ourselves with Christ. We have a duty to forgive, regardless of how badly we've been hurt or wronged. Paul instructs us, and he says this to the believers in Colossians, Colossians chapter 3, 12 to 14. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you have a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues put on love which binds them all together in perfect unity. See, our, our forgiveness is encouraged by the fact that God has had mercy upon us for our sins. Now, God's forgiveness is altogether above what man's conception of it is. If God commands us as his children to forgive, if he commands it, if he calls us to exemplify his attitude and to be imitators of him as his beloved children, then there must be an ocean of forgiving love in his own heart towards us. Now, I understand. It's not our natural propensity, is it? Like I said, bitterness, revenge, and withholding affection and anger is the default. We want to, inside, make that person pay somehow for what they've done to us. And that expresses itself in different ways, doesn't it? But we don't always know the root cause of why people hurt us. It's always been said that hurt people hurt others. And God knows the core of everything. He knows the root of everything. And God also knows that it's not natural for us to forgive because of our sin nature Yes, we're born again, but we still have to wrestle against the old man, don't we? Or the old lady. We have to wrestle. God has allowed us to have that to carry through our lives as we live here on the earth. In our flesh, we want to do God's job for him. Isn't that, you know, sin is so much like that. Sin is all about trying to be the boss, right? If you, if you sin, you're really trying to establish yourself as the chief, as the boss. That was the original sin in the garden. Satan tempted them. Don't you want to be like God? Oh, yes. I'd like to be like God. I'd like to have the controls. We've been called as Christians to be Christ-like ones. And what is that? What is Christ's attitude towards those who hurt him? Remember on the cross? When he was dying for the sins of the world, for no sin of his own, the creator and sustainer of all things stretched out his arms and allowed them to pound spikes through his wrists and spikes through his his ankles and his feet. He allowed that. Why? Because of his great love. And what did he do when he was dying for the sins of the people who were lost in their sin? When he was the innocent lamb? He said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. As dearly loved children. What this is saying in Colossians that I just read is clothe yourselves with the attitude of Christ. And that means 
practically. <laughs> See, the spiritual man that walks with God embraces forgiveness. Remember that scripture, and in, in the, I like how it says it in the King James Version, actually. I, I like it. It says, walk ye in the Spirit, and you will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Well, one of the lusts of the flesh is the thirst to seek out revenge, the thirst to play the role of judge, jury, and executioner. But if we choose to yield to the gentle voice of the Holy Spirit, He will help us to overcome our natural propensity towards unforgiveness. And for a Christian who's desiring to live a life that is pleasing to God and to walk in step or to walk ye in the Spirit, forgiveness isn't just an option. It's not negotiable. It's a command from God that must be acted upon. Well, suppose you were to ask yourself this question. How, must, how often must I admire what beautiful and majestic creation surrounds me that God has made? Or how often must I show love to my children? Or how often must I show sympathy for others who are suffering? The fact is that no person who is a genuine follower of Christ will place limitations on those questions I just asked, would they? Placing a limit on these things would be unthinkable in the mind of a godly individual. Asking questions like that are unreasonable. So then God knowing everything and what He says in His Word, understanding your circumstances, Maybe you've had terrible circumstances, unimaginable pain, unimaginable suffering because of another person's sin towards you. Placing a limit on that, according to the scriptures, is of forgiveness is unreasonable. Seven times only? No. Seventy times seven. Now, Jesus was not suggesting that all of us who have been hurt have a calculator in our head or or a ledger, and we write down, okay, that's one, two, okay, he's got, oh, that's a lot, 490 times. Oh, that's a lot of times. I'm going to keep track of each one of those, and when he gets to 490, tough luck, Charlie. You've stepped over the line. Now, I don't have to forgive you any longer. Now, that's not the spirit of this. Jesus used a word play to say to us that we must forgive people unconditionally. Forgiveness has no parameters. Putting a a limitation on forgiveness is the same as putting a limitation on love or sympathy or or thankfulness. But unfortunately, this model of Forgiveness is, in the world's perspective, all too common with people in the church. The story is told of a man who was lying in a hospital bed, and he's dying. And his pastor urged him to reconcile and to forgive someone who had injured him very greatly in the past. And after much persuasion, the person said to the minister, if I die, I will forgive him, but if I live, he'd better get out of my way. Do not be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You see, God has given us His Spirit, and His Spirit has given us life. You're no longer a child that is a slave to sin. We're going to talk a little bit about that. You see, we need God's help. He's given us the provisions. and We need God's help to release past hurts and situations to Him. If we don't, we're just like someone who sweeps up a room full of dirt 
and makes it nice and neat and takes the pile of dirt and just moves it behind a door. Eventually, the dirt's just going to go back in, right? So bitterness and unforgiveness have a funny way of destroying everyone who come into contact with it. In Mark 11.25, Jesus instructs his disciples and he says, and when do you stand praying? If you hold anything against anyone, forgive them so that your Father in heaven may forgive you. Okay, well, pastor, we must forgive others if we are to be forgiven. Well, what this is not saying is that if you harbor unforgiveness against something that positionally you are unsaved as a, as a Christian. It's not saying that. The statement by Jesus is, is referring to the judicial forgiveness that God gives us at the time of our salvation, but it's more than that. Okay, Once you have received that forgiveness for your sins, there is a parental uh, dealing with us as one of his beloved children. Your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. You know, there are people out there and and people maybe that sit in churches. Maybe there's someone here in this particular assembly and and you've never really fully surrendered your will to Jesus Christ. You've held on. Well, the Bible says that if you're unwilling to repent, turn away from your sin and follow Him, if, that, if you've never come to that point where you're willing to do that, you're not a true believer. Confessing the Lord with your mouth and believing. Believing is more than just lip service. Believing is willing to let go of the things that you are bound by, by the sin that you've been bound by. And if you're not willing to forgive The Holy Spirit can never make his home in you. You see, the Lord wants us to let go. To let go of our sin. There are people that know about God, all about him, but they don't know him because of this particular issue. They've never been willing to let go. Never been willing to let go. So they might come to church, they might sing the songs, but there's no connection in the Spirit with the Holy Spirit of God because we're not regenerated until we repent because belief, true belief, is contingent upon repentance and being willing to walk away and turn the opposite way and follow the Lord Jesus Christ. When Jesus Christ said, follow me, that's exactly what it meant. Follow me. Follow my ways. Follow my heart. Follow my attitude. Follow in every aspect that I call you to follow. Disciples, Christian, Christ like one. Christ like one. But most of us here today, you're hearing this message, you're saved, and you have, in fact, repented, and, and the Holy Spirit has made his home in you, but forgiveness is hard. Does anyone find forgiveness hard sometimes? Double hands. I do. You do too. And you can give this to the Lord and then find yourself in a position where that person does something to you again or even if you see that person, they walk past you, all of a sudden, this feeling comes up again. This feeling of bitterness. What do we do as a Christian? We say, Lord, I am weak. You are strong. I choose this day to submit myself to your Holy Spirit. I choose to let this go. Help me, Lord, in my weakness. Because I can't do this alone. There's no way that I can. And when we do that, God, there's a release that takes place inside. And you are aware of this, right? Yeah, tomorrow you might wrestle with this issue again. That's okay. God knows that. 
you're still in a fleshly body, we wrestle inside, right, over these things. So, if we choose not to, if we choose to turn away and say, no, I'm not going to do that right now, guess what's going to happen? There's going to be a break in the closeness of your relationship with your Heavenly Father. Your prayers are going to bounce off the ceilings. The Lord cannot bless this kind of heart. Yeah, you may be His child, but you're prodigal in your heart. And He's not going to bless that. He's open, wide open arms. Come back. Come. You know, if we yield to the temptation to to bear unforgiveness, you know, there is scripture that we're going to read here. Apostle Peter tells us in 2 Peter 1, 3 to 9, his divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. You hear that? Not just some things. His divine power, the power of the Holy Spirit, has given us everything we need for a godly life. What is a godly life? To walk in the footsteps of our Lord Jesus Christ in his attitude and the way he treats other people. Well, you can't get nailed to a cross and look out upon people with compassion that are doing it to you and say, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. You can't do that. But I'm telling you this right now, the Holy Spirit of the living God, when he takes his home and makes his home inside of your heart, has full access to your heart, and he gives you overcoming power. It is no longer I that liveth, but Christ that liveth in me. You can't, but he can. It's a matter of obedience, and it's a matter of yielding. Hmm. For this reason, okay, sorry, sorry, backtrack. First Peter, or Second Peter chapter 1, verse 4. Through these he has given us his very great and precious promises, so that through them you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. Is that, is that ring to what we just spoke about here? God wants us to be participators in the divine nature, and escape the corruption of the world caused by evil desires. The evil desire for vengeance. For this reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self-control. And to self-control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness, and to godliness mutual affection, and to mutual affection love. Love that keeps no records of wrongs. Right? First Corinthians 13 kind of love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. You want to walk close with God? You want God to walk closely with you? You've got to let go. You've got to say, Lord, I need you to take the reins. That song that was out there in the world, Jesus Take the Wheel, I know people just sing that offhandedly. Like it's just some sort of tune. Well, that, no, that, that's real. For a believer in Jesus Christ, a true believer in Jesus Christ, Jesus, take the wheel. I can't do this on my own. I can't. I haven't got... That, that's, it rings. There's a resonance in there because people, even if they're not believers, they know that they can't do it on their own. Inwardly, they know. That's why it resonates. But for us, as believers in Christ, Jesus, please take the wheel. I can't do this. The Apostle Paul writes to the church in Romans 6, and he says, Romans 6, 11 to 13, in the same way count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ. Therefore, in, in Christ Jesus, therefore do not let sin, notice that phrase there, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. There's a partnership here. The Spirit gives you overcoming power, but you must walk in step with Him. You must walk in, Ye in the Spirit. You must partner with the Lord and say, Lord, I must make a choice and I'm trusting in you to give me the power to do it. So, do not offer, your part, do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, 
but rather offer yourselves to God as though those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. Hmm. <sighs> the scripture is so packed, isn't it? Every time you look into it, it's, it's like there's, there's a depth that just defies understanding, that, that just breaks open to new things every time you read it. It's powerful. And this is why the, the Apostle John also writes in his letter, in 1 John chapter 1, 5, starting, this is the message that we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim that we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is also the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. See, Jesus knew the destructive boundaries of unforgiveness were far-reaching. He knew that the ones who refused to heed his instruction wouldn't just hurt themselves, but they'd wind up being far away from him in their hearts. Intimacy with him would be distant. And they, and they would also distance themselves from everyone else that God has placed around them. And, and this is why... <laughs> He provided for us a way so that we could be close to Him. So that we could be forgiven. Now, we're not talking about positionally. We're talking relationally here. You understand the difference? When you come to Christ, all things are new. You're a new creation. You're no longer a slave to sin. You don't have to obey your sin nature anymore. You're not a slave to it any longer. You, you know what you are now? You're a slave to righteousness. <laughs> God has changed things. He's changed the tables. <sighs> the system of this world tells us when we are hurt by someone to seek Revenge because they become your enemy. When it's appropriate. When it's in your best interest. But that's not the way of the Spirit. Paul says again in Romans 12, 17 to 21, Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends. But leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not overcome, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Now imagine you're walking down a street. Imagine this. Some guy comes running along. If you're a lady, he rips your purse out of, his, out of your hands and he's bolting and he's trying to get away. You're a guy, you're walking down the, down the, down the sidewalk and all of a sudden, your wallet disappears from, from your pants pocket. You feel something and you go, hey, my wallet's gone and then you see the guy running. Okay. Let's say that guy who's running with your wallet or your purse in hand is so busy trying to get away that he's not paying attention to the traffic when he runs across the street and he gets hit by a car. Boom! He gets hit by a car leveled on the street, laying on the street, writhing in agony. Would you still have the heart to feel compassion? 
would you render assistance if you could? Maybe you say, oh, you got what he's deserved. But that's not the way of Christ. The way of Christ would be filled with compassion for that person. Why was he stealing my wallet? Why was he stealing my purse? There's things going on in that person's life that I don't really get. I don't know where they're coming from. Maybe they're addicted. Maybe they've forged bad habits. Maybe they've been taught that nobody looks after me, so I have to deal with it myself and look after myself. Not worry about anyone else. I just need to get what I need to get. Isn't that person a person? <laughs> Still a person. A person for whom Christ has died. That Christ loves and wants to see saved, delivered, and healed. Yet we don't understand what makes people do what they do. But one thing is for certain. Brothers and sisters. Is that God wants us to see that person through his eyes. Hey, if it's a brother and sister in Christ and you've been hurt, God gives prescriptions in there. We're not going to get into all that this morning because there is a prescription for how to deal with someone who hurts us or who, who sins against us in Scripture. Well, one thing I will leave you with is Galatians 6, 1 and 2 says, Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should re restore that person gently. But watch yourselves or you also may be tempted. Carry each other's burdens. In this way you fulfill the law of Christ. The law of Christ is the law of love. Hmm. Okay, this is a lot of food for thought, isn't it? Because we wrestle with this issue. We live in this world, we're going to get hit. And when we get hit, we're wrestling with this issue. But Peter says in a second letter, chapter 2, 1 to 3, therefore rid yourselves of all malice, malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, slander of every kind, like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may be growing up, may grow up in your salvation now that you've tasted that the Lord is good. Do we need to grow in this area, folks? I think we do. All of us, if we're honest, we need to grow in this area. And one of the things we have to realize, we're going to be going to communion right now. Some people get this wrong, okay? They say, yeah, I struggle. I struggle with, that, with forgiveness. I, I struggle with other things, other sins that my flesh pushes on me and, and I yield to it. Yep, I'm guilty. I don't have it all down, Lord. And then they choose not to take communion because they don't feel like they're worthy. Let me get this one thing straight right here and right now. You are not righteous because of the good things that you do. You are righteous because the precious blood of Jesus was shed for you on Calvary. You are righteous because His body was broken so that you could be healed. All you like sheep have gone astray. But He has laid upon Him the iniquity of us all. So when you come before the communion table, you come before the Lord as one who is bought by the precious blood of Jesus and you need to thank Him for His grace. If you've got stuff that you're struggling through, yes, you need to give that to Him. You need to ask God to forgive you if you're struggling with something in your life, if you're struggling with sin. That's appropriate to do before communion. In 1 Corinthians, the believers, they were coming together and they weren't recognizing the body and blood of Christ. They were coming to have a big meal and a feast and they were forgetting people who didn't have anything and they were stuffing their faces. And then people who were poor were coming and they weren't having any kind of... They, they, were, they were treating communion tritely like it was nothing. There's instructions given by Paul that says, 
Don't take communion in an unworthy matter. Don't take communion unless you observe communion remembering the bo broken body and shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you do, you, there's con condemnation that is a result. Some of you are sick. Some of you have fallen asleep, says Paul, because of this. God can't bless us when our hearts are resistant to him. But get, get this, folks. When you come as a true believer in Jesus Christ, you are clean before him. You are clean. Isn't that a wonderful thing? The grace of God was not given that we continue in sin. It was given to save us from our sin. So those of us who have been saved need to ask God to refine us with refiner's fire. I'm going to ask the fellows that have been requested to assist with communion to come forward right now.